All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you had a nice little break. Um, but welcome back to the course as we uh, continue on here. <clears throat> so if you recall up to this point, we've started with our raw sequencing reads. Uh, we've gone through importing our sequencing reads into Chime 2, um, denoising them using data 2, wherein we identified our ASVs. Um, we built a phylogenetic tree using our sequences and then use that phylogenetic tree to calculate and visualize some of our diversity metrics, both alpha, alpha and beta diversity. The last step, and the one that I think is pretty exciting, um, is uh, sort of what I teased at the end of the last part of the last uh, session of the course, um, which is identifying exactly which taxa are present in our samples. So, as a result of that uh, ASV identification process within data two, we now have a list of uh, representative sequences. Uh, essentially, these are sequences that represent the original sequences present in each of our samples. Right now, they don't have a whole lot of meaning since they're just you know, really long strings of, of uh, bases. And so what we're interested in is going from those sequences uh, directly to the identity of the taxa from which that came. And this can help us to identify the composition of someone's microbiome uh, and use that to give more context to what, um, to, to how their microbiome might be affecting them, right? So in terms of how um, at risk they might be for inf infection of pathogenic bacteria, such as C. difficile. So before the break, I asked you to kind of think about um, how would you how would you do that? How would you go from a representative sequence, one of our ASVs, to the identity of an organism? Um, but before we really answer that question, let's quickly uh, consider and have a little refresher on taxonomy and how that sort of works. So I think we're mostly all familiar with taxonomic ranks, but essentially we have these hierarchical ranks, which get more and more specific. So down at the species level, we have the most sort of a specific um, taxonomic rank, wherein there's very little genetic diversity at that level. At each level that we go up from the species level, we see a little bit more diversity, um, both like a little bit more genetic diversity and divergence between species. Um, so at the genus level, for instance, there's more diversity than at the species level. For bacteria, this can be a little bit challenging and we can actually get even more granular down to the strain level, uh, which is essentially, um, any given genome, um, but this is generally how it's done. An important thing to note is that with the 16S data that we're using for today's course, uh, the lowest taxonomic rank that we can confidently assign to our reads is the genus level. Uh, and the reason for that is below the genus level at the species or strain level, there's simply not enough, um, there's simply not enough diversity in that 16S gene to confidently say it came from one species versus another. So we'll be doing all of our taxonomic assignments to the genus level. This We run into an issue here though, because like we mentioned, there is some genetic uh, divergence and, and variability within that genus level. And so this can actually um, bring up an issue with what I think is probably the most intuitive approach to the question that I posed on that last slide. So um, you might think, you know, we have this list of representative sequences, our ASVs, we could just compare that directly against the database of known genes um, and uh, using that look for matches and determine exactly where our ASVs came from. But this doesn't always really work well uh, in practice. And the reason for that is that the database that we'll use uh, to, to compare you know, the, the ASVs against our reference is known as representative of the actual taxa in our samples. Some samples or some taxa might be missing from the database. Um, and still others that might be, you know, the, the taxon might be present, the strain that was used to generate a reference sequence uh, might diverge a little bit genetically from the strain that we actually find in someone's gut microbiome. So for instance, it might be a, a lab strain of E. coli um, that was used to generate a reference sequence in our database, um, but that's a little bit distinct from the actual E. coli we see uh, in someone's microbiome. So instead, we need to think of sort of a more general approach, more generalizable approach that allows us to um, determine whether or not the, the sequence that we're looking at in our ASVs um, generally matches what's present in our reference database. So one thing that we could consider is codon usage. 
So we know that the DNA code is degenerative. So that means that there's um, multiple codons that can code for the same amino acid. Uh, and in practice, sometimes these codon, the specific codon usage can be um, taxon specific. So some taxa will use one codon uh, versus another for the same amino acid. So this is helpful, but it doesn't really mean that we can use that to um, identify all the different possible genera that are present in our samples. But it does give us an idea for how we can approach this problem. So instead of looking for exact sequence matches, what we can consider instead is whether the overall sequence uh, is generally conserved between the taxa that we see in our samples and our reference database. And so to do exactly that, we use what's called a multinomial naive phase method. And so this sounds a little complicated, but really it's exactly what I was just describing and just involves a little uh, clever math in order to get uh, to our classifications. So let's say we begin with a query sequence. In this case, we see the query sequence on the top left here. Uh, it's, you know, as an example, it's just six spaces long. To begin, we can subdivide the query sequence into all possible subsequences that are shorter than that initial query sequence. And these are commonly referred to as k-mers. So in this case, we can divide um, this query sequence into uh, these, these uh, three base long sequence subsequences. So we have an ACG, a CGC, a GCG, and another CGC. Um, and these k-mers are uh, just subsequences of length k. So in this case, um, we, we've constructed three mers. And it turns out that if we subdivide our initial query sequence into all possible k-mers, we can build a profile of the frequency or a probability of finding these k-mers within that query sequence that can be relatively taxon specific. Um, and this essentially allows us to determine exactly what we were discussing earlier, which is, does the composition of this sequence stay somewhat conserved between the, the sequence we see in our data and our reference model? Um, while allowing for some gen genetic divergence between um, some genetic divergence between our query sequence and, and the reference model. Um, and this accounts for the fact that generally, uh, through evolution, as the um, sequence might change here and there, it won't do so drastically. Uh, it'll mostly be, be small pieces uh, here and there. And so the overall composition of that sequence will remain mostly unchanged. So let's take a look at our, our reference model in, on, on the right-hand side here. So in this case, our, our reference database, uh, is, as an example, we just have, have two taxa, uh, taxon one and taxon two. Uh, the first thing we might consider is the probability of finding one of these taxa within our reference database. So for instance, if our reference database has 15 different strains of, of E. coli that are represented, uh, but only one strain of fecalibacterium, for instance, we might consider the probability of selecting one of these those E. coli strains over the single fecalibacterium strain. Um, and this is called the prior uh, prior probability, and this is then um, different methods differ on whether or not they consider that or not. But it's an important thing to to take into account. As we're building up our reference model, essentially what we do is we take our reference sequence for each of our taxa. And we calculate the frequency or the probability of finding each of these k-mers. So for instance, for taxon one, the probability of finding an ACG is about 25%. Uh, probability of finding a CGC is also 25% and so on. And so we can do this for all the taxa in our reference database uh, and compile a profile for each of these of these k-mer frequencies. In and of itself, these k-mer frequencies are not that useful. And that's because essentially they, they say, now, what is the probability of finding um, a query given a specific taxon? And really what we're interested in looking at is the opposite question. What is the probability of finding a taxon given a specific query? Um, and this is where Bayes method comes in. So in naive mul multinomial naive Bayes, this is the Bayes part. So Bayes theorem is shown down here on the, the bottom right-hand side. Uh, and this allows us to sort of flip that probability around. So using some, some clever math, we can go from that probability of finding uh, a query given a specific taxon uh, to finding uh, the probability of, of finding a taxon given a specific query. Um, and to do that, we can essentially go through our query sequence and all the specific k of a query sequence and find the corresponding probability 
of finding each of those k-mers within each taxon in our reference model. So let's take a look at this top line first. First, we take the prior probability. So again, the probability of finding taxon, this taxon one in our reference database and multiply that against the probability of finding each of our uh, specific k-mers from our query sequence in taxon one. So we, multiply, we have one ACG, two CGCs, and one GCG. Uh, we find those corresponding probabilities, multiply them together, and we're left with the probability of finding taxon one given our query sequence. We can do the same thing for all the different taxa in our reference database. And we're finally, and we'll be left with one taxon that will have the highest probability of being present given our query sequence. In this case, that's taxon one. Uh, one thing you might notice is that in Bayes, uh, uh, in Bayes method here, we are ignoring the denominator down here, which is the probability of finding uh, a given query. Um, in practice, though, we essentially assume that finding any specific query within our sample data um, has the exact same probability. And so we can effectively ignore that without changing the functional probabilities of, of finding a taxon given a specific query. So in the end, we just choose the taxon with the highest probability um, and assign uh, that query sequence, that the name of that taxon. Um, in practice, you can really use any sort of machine learning method uh, that's based on KMERS to do this. Um, but we will use, uh, today we'll use multinomial naive Bayes. And it turns out this is actually a, a pretty robust and accurate method that gives better generalization than just look at, uh, aligning sequence reads directly. Uh, and it also gives much faster results. So this is a, a pretty quick process overall. Um, so uh, now that we've kind of discussed how that works, um, let's switch back over to the notebook and begin assigning taxonomy to each of our ASVs. Great. So hopefully you still have the notebook open um, and hopefully it's still connected. If you've run into any issues where your no notebook has disconnected for some reason or you've lost any of your data, um, don't hesitate to reach out to the TAs. As a reminder, any of the outputs that we've already produced to this point are available to you in that treasure chest directory in within that materials folder. So if you have to restart, you can always find the material, the uh, chime inputs that we'll be using here uh, in that treasure chest folder. So let's take a look at how we can use Chime to classify the taxonomy of our ASVs. Uh, the first thing we'll do is use a plugin in Chime called Feature Classifier. So as you might guess, this will take our ASVs and do that uh, multinomial naive Bayes method that we just discussed in order to assign them taxonomy. Uh, specifically, we'll be using the classify-sklearn action within that plugin. Uh, as inputs for this, this function, uh, we'll be using our representative sequences. So again, this is just our list of ASVs as, as identified by data two earlier in the course. We'll also give it a classifier. Uh, so in this case, this is a specific classifier that contains all those KMER profiles for several reference taxa. Um, and this one is actually collapsed to the genus level. So if you recall, we'll, we'll be doing all of our classification to the genus level, since that's the most granular, that's the most granular taxonomic level to which we can confidently assign taxonomy. Um, and you'll also see this, uh, this last bit here that tells us that this classifier was actually trained specifically on the V4 region of that 16S gene. So this is very specific to uh, the data that we're working on today uh, and should return us very specific results, as opposed to using a classifier that's trained on the entire 16S gene. We'll again assign two CPUs to get this job done um, and go ahead and run this cell. Uh, as an output, we'll end up with a new Chime artifact called taxa.qza. Uh, and this artifact will contain all of the taxonomic assignments of our uh, ASVs that we uh, had stored in our representative sequences artifact previously. Um, so this, this can take a couple minutes here, um, really shouldn't take too long. But now we can kind of start to consider what we will do uh, now that we have our uh, ASVs classified uh, for taxonomy. Um, the first thing that we'll consider is maybe visualizing our data in terms of the taxonomic uh, breakdown of each of our samples. So what we can do, in fact, is use uh, another plugin within Chime called Taxa, which will take our, uh, our uh, list of, of abundances that we produce from data 
as well as the taxonomic assignments that are currently being calculated uh, and use those to create a visualization uh, for each of our samples in terms of their taxonomic composition. And so in this case, we're also adding the metadata file so that we can have some associated context for each of our samples. Let's go ahead and run this next cell, which will take those classified reads uh, and visualize them as a taxonomic breakdown of each one of our samples. Um, and for this, we'll again, uh, once this, this cell finishes, we will download the output and bring it over to the Chime 2 viewer, like we did in the first part of the course, um, and take a look at, at what we can find and what, what sort of uh, insights this might give us into our, our data. OK, so if we scroll all the way to the bottom of our, uh, yeah, if we scroll all the way to the bottom of our file directory, we will download our taxa underscore bar plot QZV. And so now that's downloaded, we'll go back over to the Chime 2 viewer. Uh, and take a look at what this visualization looks like. Okay, so hopefully yours looks like this as well. Um, so right now it's a little hard to see. Everything's a little bit cramped. We can use this slider on the top left to increase the width of our plot, uh, just to make everything a little bit easier to see. Um, okay, so now we see a bunch of green lines, and that doesn't really tell us very much. Uh, but what's happening here is that Chime will automatically uh, give us this summary at the, the highest taxonomic level. So right now, all we can see is that all of our reads are classified as bacteria, which makes sense. That's you know generally what we expect to see here. Um, but what we can do is use this first dropdown to specify the taxonomic level that we're interested in. If we go to level two, this is the phylum level. And now we can see that there's a distinct composition for each one of our samples. If we go even more distinct, uh, we can go down to the genus level, which is level six. Um, and now we can see that for each of our samples, we have, you know, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of, of uh, different genera that are present in each of these samples. So this is cool, but uh, without additional context, we can't really make any insights into this, right? Um, but what we can do is go to the third dropdown over here that says sort samples by, click on that, and select disease state. So again, this will separate our samples into healthy individuals and individuals with recurrent C. difficile infections. So let's click that. And now we can see the healthy individuals on the left-hand side and those folks that have uh, recurrent C. difficile infections on the right-hand side. Uh, and now this is pretty neat, right? So we definitely see a signature that looks to be related to healthy individuals, uh, which looks like a little bit more abundance as well as even, um, yeah, higher abund abundance of, excuse me, <laughs> higher richness of taxa. So more taxa seem to be present, as well as more evenness of taxa, right? So, and this fits with what we had seen in our diversity metrics, where in the alpha diversity of our healthy individuals was much higher, significantly higher than the individuals with recurrent C. difficile infection. And if we look at those individuals with, with the infection, we can see that they're generally dominated by a couple taxa uh, and look to have a little bit less uh, species richness within those samples. Um, so I encourage you to you know, take a look at this, see what else you can maybe determine about the microbial composition of our samples um, uh, in the future. We can also sort by other sample metadata if we wanted to, uh, and also look at other uh, taxonomic levels that might interest us. Um, you'll also notice that if we scroll over any part of the bar plot, we can see the uh, associated taxonomic assignment at the top of the bar plot, uh, as well as the percent relative abundance uh, of that taxon within a sample. Great, but for now, let's switch back over to the notebook and continue with our analysis. So now we have our taxonomic assignments. We also have our abundances of each of our ASVs. One thing that we might be interested in doing is collapsing those together at the genus level to build a table that essentially has the abundance of each one of our uh, assigned taxa for each of our samples. And that's what this uh, cell will do. We'll use that taxa plugin uh, and the collapse functionality within it to take our table containing our abundances, as well as our taxon uh, taxonomic assignment, um, and tell it to collapse to the sixth taxonomic level, which again is the genus level. Uh, and this will save a new Chime artifact uh, that we'll call genus.qza. Now, if we go to our uh, file directory, we can see that on the left-hand side. You might have to refresh your directory again, and there it is. 
one thing that we might be interested in now that we're sort of reaching the, the terminus of our Chime 2 pipeline is how do we export our data uh, that's currently is a, a Chime artifact uh, into a form that we can use for, for other tools. Say maybe we have additional computational pipelines or we want to bring our, our data out and do some analysis in R. Uh, we might need the data in a different format. Uh, and to do that, we can actually do the opposite of what we did at the beginning of the course, uh, which is use this Chime tools export functionality. So if we run this cell, essentially this is taking our input path, which currently is our genus.qza artifact that we just constructed a moment ago, um, and defining an export path. So what this will do is take our genus.qza artifact and save it, export it, and save it to a directory that we'll call exported. If we look at that exported directory, what we see is something called feature table.biome. So dot biome is another data type um, that's useful for some analyses, but it's not the most easily readable for us. So to the cell, we also added a, a second action uh, called biome convert. So what this will do is actually call the biome library, not Chime, uh, and convert that biome file that we just exported to be a, a tab separated value table. So here we're taking uh, feature table.biome uh, and creating something called genus.tsv. And that tab separated value file will be much easier for us to read later on in the course. So uh, let's take a look at our, at our file directory. Um, and there it is, there is genus.tsv. So um, now it's, it's probably a good idea to, to take a look at what exactly this table that we just constructed actually looks like. So let's run this cell, which again, we'll use pandas, which is um, our data frame management tool to read this tab separated value file um, and print it out for us. Great, so this is what it looks like. And you, what we can see is a couple of things on the, um, the index of this data frame. So that, that farthest left column contains our taxonomic identifiers. So we've assigned taxonomy to each of our ASVs and this is the, <clears throat> that corresponding taxonomic assignment. You can see that it covers the entire uh, sort of taxonomic uh, hierarchy. So starting at the kingdom level, uh, all the way down to the genus level. You'll also notice that some of these aren't uh, annotated all the way to the genus level. And that's because our naive, um, our multinomial naive Bayes methodology can sometimes determine taxonomy uh, down to higher orders of taxonomy. Uh, but not necessarily all the way to the, the genus level for some reads. Um, so for those, you might see a couple of sort of semicolons followed by uh, underscores with no additional data. Um, to the right of this data frame, we'll also see a column representing each one of our samples. So again, we have eight samples, eight columns, and the values within each cell represent the count of reads that correspond to that, um, that taxon within that sample. Uh, so this file, this uh, data format is is pretty useful actually, because we can we can see sort of the abundance of each taxon within each sample. Um, and tomorrow, Alex will take you through a process of using data that looks a lot like this to build uh, mechanistic models of the gut microbiome. Um, so you can see how this would be pretty pretty useful information. Um, but for now. Uh, what we'll do is actually, now that we've exported our data out of Chime, it's actually useful for us, useful to us in terms of um, applying it to uh, additional um, packages or visualization tools. So uh, if we want, if we're more fam familiar using something like Seaborn or Plot9, uh, now that we've exported our data out of Chime, we can visualize our results uh, using one of those. And so that's what we'll actually do down here in this block of, uh, block of code. Um, is we will build a visualization, specifically a heat map, uh, using a tool called Seaborn. Before we start doing that, we need to import two more uh, packages into our uh, notebook environment. First, we'll import something called NumPy, which will allow us to do some uh, mathematical um, analysis and methods. Uh, and then we'll also import Seaborn, which is our visualization tool, uh, into, our, into our environment. Before we build our visualization, we'll need to transform our data a little bit uh, and format our, our data frame to be a little bit uh, more appealing visually. The first thing we'll do in this first line of code is um, sort of clean up the, uh, 
ASV identifiers that show up in this first column of our data frame. So like we can see, we have um, that each of these identifiers covers the entire hierarchy of taxonomy. But that might get a little bit clunky on our um, heat map. So instead of doing that, we'll use this string split functionality to split each one of these super long strings into a bunch of substrings. And it'll do that every time it sees the semicolon, since we identify the semicolon as our operator. Then it then we'll tell uh, we'll tell it to uh, select only the the sixth string. So since we start counting from zero, uh, string five is actually the sixth string, uh, and save just that string. So what this will do is drop all of the, those substrings prior to uh, the final. Uh, substring in our index, which is the, the genus identifier. And that'll make our plot just a little bit more easy to read uh, and understandable. We'll then also tell it to drop any rows where the genus isn't um, identified. So if we see something like this, where uh, we just have an empty, uh, empty identifier where it should be identifying a genus, we'll tell pandas to drop those, those rows. Lastly, um, since we have you know, a pretty big data frame, this is 163 rows total, uh, we'll tell it to sample, take a random sample of 50, uh, 50 rows from that data frame. So 50 random genera uh, from our abundance data frame uh, that we'll use for building our visualization. Okay, now last thing before we build our visualization is we're gonna do another uh, normalization technique. So this time, uh, we'll do what's called a center log ratio transform. So that sounds a little confusing, but essentially what we're doing is for each data point, we take the log of its abundance uh, and subtract that from the log of the mean of the abundance. And essentially what this does is it allows us to take this data, which uh, as you can see, sort of um, spans several orders of magnitude from uh, you know really large numbers of reads down to just uh, one or two. Uh, it allows us to compare those more directly and a way to understand the center log ratio a little bit more uh, easily is uh, a value of zero for a center log ratio um, indicates that the uh, that that specific taxon is as abundant as the mean. Uh, a positive value means it's more abundant than the mean and a negative value means it's less abundant than the mean. So this is just a way for us to normalize our data in a way that makes it more understandable and more easy to compare on a sample, uh, on a per sample basis. And then finally, the last thing that we'll do is actually call Seaborn, our visualization tool, um, and build what's called a cluster map. So this is essentially a, a clustered heat map uh, that will take our new data table, uh, just called transformed after our center log ratio transform. Um, and we'll actually take the transpose of that. So we'll just flip it on that side, essentially. Um, the last few things are just formatting. This will be the, the color map that we use to color in our heat map. Uh, we'll turn on X tick, tick labels, uh, which you'll see in a second and then also define the figure size. So if we go ahead and run this cell, um, this should only take a second or two, and we're left with a pretty nice looking heat map. So you can see on the, the x-axis, we have just our genus identifiers for those gen genera that are uh, identified. Um, we have a random sample of 50. So keep in mind that since we all sampled 50 random genera, your heat map might look a little bit different from mine. Each row represents one of the samples in our data. Um, and then the coloring of each cell represents the center log ratio transform, centered log ratio transform of the abundance of a given genera, a genus within a sample. And so you might start to notice some interesting patterns here. Uh, for instance, um, Vilionella seems to be really abundant in these first three tax, uh, first three samples, uh, and less so in the last five or so. You might also see some taxa that are. Um, you know, highly present in one sample, like here, uh, and not so much in others. You might see some taxa that are uh, present across a lot of samples, but missing from a few others as well. Um, so this is just one way that we can look at our compositional data in a way that uh, will allow us to infer a little bit more about our community structure and learn a little bit about the composition uh, without getting too in the weeds. Um, so I encourage you to take a look a little bit closer at this. Um, maybe sample you know, 50 other random genera and then take a look at how the, the output, output changes. 
Um, if you were really interested, you could also append the, the metadata that we looked at previously to determine how some of these compositional differences might vary between healthy and unhealthy individuals. Um, and if you find anything cool, make sure to, to put it on Slack and we'll be happy to, to listen to maybe what your, your findings look like. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of how we can use Chime data, export it out as a, a more readable file, and then use that in uh, any other visualization tool that you might be more comfortable with. All right, so that's the end of the data analysis portion of our course. Uh, at the end of this notebook, you'll find an extra exercise um, that I'll leave for you to work on on your own, wherein we'll revisit that phylogenetic tree that we constructed earlier in the course. Now that we have our taxonomy assignments, we can actually add to that uh, some metadata in terms of um, you know, no, uh, which samples come from healthy and unhealthy individuals, as well as the taxonomic assignments of each of our taxa. Um, and that will construct a new visualization, which you can take over to the Chime 2 viewer uh, and answer some of the questions here. Um, again, feel free to, to share with us any cool things that you might learn from this visualization. Um, you'll be able to annotate that tree based on healthy and unhealthy individuals and see if there's any clustering of taxa between the two groups. Um, so on your own time, maybe before the, the next talk, uh, take a look at this exercise. And if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask the, uh, the TAs on Slack. We'll be happy to help you. Um, but for now, let's switch back over to the slides one last time. Um, so yeah, like I said, now it's it's your turn to do some coding. Go ahead and, and take a crack at that, that exercise. Uh, and feel free to use that Colab notebook to play around with Chime some more. Maybe you have some ideas for other analyses or investigations that you can get out of our uh, the, the data that we analyzed today. Um, and we'd love to hear about it. So uh, with that, we are done with today's portion of the course. Uh, before we end, I'd like to thank everyone that was involved with making this happen, including um, our instructors and our wonderful TAs that have been uh, following along and answering all your questions on Slack, uh, as well as all the people behind the scenes that have helped to make this, this uh, course possible. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. I do hope you'll uh, stick around. Um, in about an hour or so, we have a, a wonderful talk by Catherine Ramos Sarmiento, who will come in and tell us a little bit more, uh, tell us about her work uh, determining some of the factors that um, raise or, or lower someone's uh, risk for C. difficile infection. And that'll be uh, really fascinating. So I, I really do hope you'll join us for that. Um, and then also that we'll see you at tomorrow as part of the course, where Alex will take you through uh, some mechanistic modeling, wherein we can um, model the invasion of C. difficile into the gut microbiome and determine which individuals are more at risk than others. So with that, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we'll now have a short break uh, until Catherine's uh, talk at 12.45. Thank you. So we have just under an hour until that talk. So. Uh, Go ahead, take a break, um, and we'll see you back here at 12.45, so uh, just under an hour from now. Thank you so much.